as Mel mentioned, my name is Dr. Sonia Mather. I'm a family physician, Parkinson's patient, having been diagnosed well over 20 years ago. I have the privilege of serving on the board of directors for the Davis Finney Foundation, and I have the very great pleasure of being your moderator today. So each time we get together, we discuss a different aspect of this disease, and if anything can be said about Parkinson's, it's that it's a complicated diagnosis. Many different body systems are affected, and that results in a myriad of number of symptoms. We all do need to take a proactive approach in order to manage the complexity of this disease in our care and optimize all aspects of our health. And nutrition is part of that approach. So today we're going to look at how Parkinson's disease affects our nutritional status and also how our dietary choices can affect our Parkinson's symptoms and perhaps even the disease itself. To allow us to address the already numerous questions that we received and probably are going to receive during the course of this webinar, we take a little bit more of a different approach and concentrate more on a Q&A format. And hopefully the discussion today will provide you with the answers you were wondering about. But as Mel mentioned, um, please do uh, send us your questions if, if we're not answering them. To help us out today, I'm so very pleased to welcome Dr. John Duda. Dr. Duda is Director of the Parkinson's Disease Research, Education and Clinical Center and Co-Director of the Center for Neurotrauma, Neurodegeneration and Restoration of the Philadelphia Veterans Administration Medical Center. He's also an Associate Professor of Neurology at the Perlman School of Medicine at the University of Pennsylvania. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Sonia. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Dr. Jude, I think we received so many questions for this particular webinar because nutrition is such a fundamental part of our lives. And it's also an aspect of our life that we feel we do have some sense of control over, unlike the diagnosis itself. So the first questions that came about to us were about weight. And I know that malnutrition is a problem for some of us with Parkinson's disease. So the first um, question we received was, I keep losing weight that I don't want to lose. What's happening and what can I do about it? And so this raises some interesting questions. Um, first of all, how much of a problem is weight loss for those of us with Parkinson's disease? That's a good question, Sonia. So there have been several studies that have tried to look at exactly what the prevalence of, of weight loss is in Parkinson's disease. And, and they vary fairly greatly, actually. But uh, a good estimate is that um, somewhere between a third and two thirds, something like that, of people at some point in the course of the illness will have problems maintaining their weight. Um, there are different reasons thought to be involved with different phases of the illness, but it, it is a common problem. Some of the typical reasons that we suggest are probably involved are obviously uh, Parkinson's disease can involve a couple different hyperkinetic movements like tremor and dyskinesias, which, which burn a lot of calories. If you're, if you're moving your hand all day, uh, um, throughout the day and your, or your body is moving around, you're going to burn more calories. And obviously, uh, you need to make up for that with caloric intake. Um, sometimes tremor and dyskinesia can even make eating difficult. If you have problems getting food to your mouth and things like that, um, it can affect how much, how much uh, food you're taking in. Parkinson's disease also affects the sense of smell in just about everybody with Parkinson's disease. And um, uh, the vast majority of what we taste is actually what we're smelling. So a lot of people with Parkinson's disease um, won't even know it, but actually have very poor sense of smell. And we think it affects just how the, the, the food tastes and how appetizing it is. So um, that can affect how much calories you're taking. And we often recommend that if that's a problem, that people try to load up on spices and, and salt and other things that can um, heighten the, the, the uh, taste of the food. Um, Obviously, some people with Parkinson's disease do develop a problem swallowing in the course of illness. In fact, as many as 82% of people at some point will have some uh, difficulties with swallowing, at least if you looked at them objectively with swallowing tests and things like that. Um, those uh, can, can obviously affect how many calories you're taking in and, and lead to weight loss. Um, and then clearly there are other things, other non-motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease that can affect your appetite and how much you eat, including anxiety and depression, insomnia, um, and sometimes nausea that arises from the medications we use. So there's a whole host of different reasons why someone with Parkinson's disease might lose weight. Hey, you mentioned, Dr. Duda, that, uh, that people um, it's quite common to lose weight with Parkinson's disease. What are the risk factors for weight loss? 
So um, the, you know, as I said, a lot of the non-motor symptoms that we see in Parkinson's disease are risk factors. So if you have uh, anxiety, depression, or trouble sleeping, certainly as the disease progresses, if you develop cognitive impairment, you can have problems uh, with, with weight loss because you forget to eat or, or lose interest in eating. Um, if you have a prominent tremor, dyskinesia, the, those are risk factors. Um, so I'll, most of those things I just mentioned, if, if you have them, uh, you know, I would recommend that people just maintain a, a regular log of their weight or, you know, if, keep track of your weight. If you, if you start losing it, then try to be proactive and address the problem before it becomes a bigger problem. And what would you say is too much weight loss? Like how, how, do, how does one decide that, that they've lost too much? And is it a matter of amount or is it a matter of time in which it's lost? That's a good question. I don't have a, I don't have a clear answer for that. I mean, obviously in the, the American um, public, a lot of people could, lose, could afford to lose a little bit of weight and, and still be a healthy weight. Um, so it depends on, on what way you start out at. There are, there are calculations that we use to try and assess your health status based on your weight. Obviously, the body mass index is one easy one that you can look up online. If you drop below a 25 in the body mass index, or below a 20, sorry, um, people start talking about that being a, an unhealthy weight. Um, the, I, I think if, uh, if the weight is starting to to come off really quickly, you know, pounds each month or, or more, then we even start looking at other um, causes for weight loss that may or may not have anything to do with the Parkinson's disease. So if you're, I don't, have, I don't want to put out a firm number out there because I don't, I don't have one, but um, if you're losing more comfortable, more weight than you're you know, comfortable losing in a given period of time, then just discuss it with your, with your Parkinson's physician or your primary care doctor. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, you mentioned some some of the physical restrictions that can sometimes make eating a, a difficult thing, or even I guess meal preparation and groceries, um, and then some of the more um, mental or emotional things like apathy, depression, cognitive changes that can also make it more difficult. Do you have any personal um, practical tips for patients or caregivers and how they might sort of circumvent that um, either disinterest in eating or difficulty in meal prep? So um, apathy and amotivation are, are big problems in Parkinson's disease. Um, there are uh, different strategies, like I, I said, trying to make the food more appealing uh, from the taste perspective by loading up with what, whatever the person with Parkinson's disease enjoys, but uh, obviously um, spices and, and high, high salt and fat and things are usually make food more appealing. Um, as far as uh, having difficulty, anybody with dysphagia or problems swallowing food should be evaluated by a speech and swallowing therapist. Uh, there are strategies that those, first they'll determine usually with a bedside swallowing examination, often followed with a, a fluoroscopic examination where you're you're, you're given a, a, a radio opaque liquid to swallow, and they watch it go. They watch your swallowing process. If they determine that you're having a particular problem, there are different behavioral um, modifications that they can recommend, and, and there's some um, other therapeutic options available. So, um, if you're if you know you're having trouble swallowing, please go get get checked out because obviously. Swallowing difficulties lead to uh, aspiration, which is food or liquid getting into your lungs, which leads to pneumonia, which is a, a big problem. Um, beyond that, if you're having problems because of motor dysfunction, to tremor or dyskinesia or something like that, I'll refer people to my occupational therapist who actually have a, a lot of different assistive devices that can be helpful for people with tremor or dyskinesia to help, help uh, get the... the a better intake of food, everything from um, liftware, which are spe special utensils that um, help dampen the, the effect of tremor on the on the utensil, to heavy utensils, to uh, plates that that uh, make it harder for you to spill off of them, and, and things like that. So well, that, that's an option as well. 
So there are some practical things that we can uh, um, Then there's also the opposite problem, weight gain. And we received a question about that as well. Um, the person wrote that no matter what I do, I keep gaining weight. What's happening and what can I do about it? So is it common to gain weight in Parkinson's disease? You mentioned the weight loss, but what about weight gain? So, so I think weight gain is clearly less common. There, there are two particular situations where I've seen it myself. Um, and those are use of dopamine agonists, which are a, a class of medications that affect the dopamine receptor. And um, they, they're known to cause problems with um, the impulse control and uh, overeating can be, can be one of them. Um, and then also for not entirely clear reasons, deep brain stimulation of the subthalamic nucleus has been shown to cause an increase in weight. And we used to think that it was uh, perhaps due to the uh, uh, resolution of, of hyperkinetic movements like dyskinesia or tremor. But it seems like there may be something more to it than that um, because people without those kinds of symptoms also can, can gain weight. So it probably has something to do with satiety and, and, and how appealing eating is and things like that. Um, except for those two situations, I mean, obviously there's lots of reasons that you could gain weight. And one of them is a poor selection of food choices. And sometimes um, a lot of the symptoms and stress that we get with Parkinson's disease leads us to make poor choices in, in our food preferences. Um, that can lead people to, to gain weight. Um, but it's, it's significantly less common than weight loss. Right, and, and one um, person wrote that their sweet tooth really kicked in since they were diagnosed four years ago. Um, they say their sugar cravings are constant and they've been gaining weight regularly. And you're wondering, is the sugar craving a side effect of the cinnamon rapinrol and what can they do to reduce or eliminate that craving? Yeah, that, that, that's another good question. Um, carb craving or sugar craving is, a, is another fairly common symptom in people with Parkinson's disease. And um, like overeating and weight gain in general, um, dopamine agonists like rapinrol have been implicated. Uh, I, I suspect that, that Cinevec could probably do it as well, but I think the agonists are much more likely to be the culprit in that situation. Um, stress uh, of any kind can also weaken our fortitude and, and, and cause us to crave uh, things that, that give us an instant gratification like sugar. Um, I think trying to change your diet, um, in, improving your sleep, if that's a problem, uh, working on some stress man management techniques like mindfulness meditation or something like that will help you kind of get a little bit better control of your urges and, and the impulses might be helpful. I mean, sugar is an addiction like anything else. It is um, a difficult one to, to eliminate. Uh, the good news is that if you can give up really high um, carbohydrate, uh, simple, simple carbohydrate intake, um, within a couple of weeks, you actually uh, can see a, an adjustment in your taste buds and your, your sense of taste so that something that used to be uh, enjoyable can be too sweet and things that are much less sweet can be enjoyable. So, um, there is hope that you won't always be be craving that really that really sweet snack. Right. Um, some of the ways that uh, Parkinson's can affect our nutritional status are the complications of the disease itself. Um, for example, the complication you mentioned about dysphagia that our gastrointestinal system might um, present with. Um, there's also constipation, which I know is an issue that really does affect quality of life for patients with Parkinson's disease that are experiencing uh, severe constipation. Um, and one of our um, listeners wrote in that they're, they're constipated all the time and they're wondering what they can do about that. But first of all, I guess, how would you define constipation? I guess we should start there. Yeah, so that, that's a good initial question because a lot of people will come in and tell me that they're constipated when they're having a bowel movement every day. So. Um, yeah, that, that really doesn't meet the, what we think of a constipation, which is a decreased frequency of bowel movements. Um, and in general, I tell people that they should be having at least two bowel movements a week. Um, you know, and obviously, uh, there's a wide range of what's normal for some people. Some people are used to going every day. And if you're only going twice a week, well, that's clearly constipation, but it's not um, 
as concerning as someone who goes four or five days without bowel movement is the risk for, for impaction of the bowel or complete blockage of the bowel. Um, a lot of other people have uh, difficulty with defecation or hard stools that are hard to pass. And that's I, a lot of people, when they come in and say constipation, that's kind of what they mean. Um, but so the, the two things are treated fairly similarly, um, at least in, in my clinic. Um, I think there are a lot of different things you can try, but some easy ones are obviously increasing your water intake because it, particularly with hard stools, the main one of the main reasons your stool is so hard is that as your bowel, your bowel movement goes through your colon, more and more water gets resorbed and the, the stool becomes really firm. But if you have more water to begin with, it's, it's, uh, it, it can, can help. And probably more importantly is how much fiber you're taking. Fiber is a component of, of plants that's only derived from plants. There's no fiber in any um, animal products. And it's been estimated that 97% of people in the United States have an insufficient fiber intake. So in, increasing the amount of dietary fiber. Uh, you can do it with supplements like Metamucil or psyllium powder. The problem with those is that they're not a complete package and it's, it can be fairly easy to, to get uh, in more trouble using those if you don't take enough water in. So I recommend that people do other things like just increasing the amount of beans and greens and whole grains and, and things like that. And then um, if you have intermittent uh, constipation, there's a, you can just Google constipation cocktail or something like that. And there's a whole bunch of different preparations that typically include prunes and apple juice and wheat bran and things like that that you mix together and take as a shot or a you know pudding or something um, to help out. And then uh, exercise clearly uh, decreases your risk of constipation. So keeping your, your body moving helps to keep your bowels moving. Um, and then finally, there are uh, pharmacologic therapies for the treatment of constipation that we rely on if, if all these other things are unsuccessful um, that include everything from stool softeners to laxatives to uh, enemas and, and things like that. Um, what about uh, probiotics? I'm sorry, there's oh. a little bit of a delay and I couldn't quite sorry. hear that. What about probiotics? Oh, probiotics, a good question. So um, there are um, different ways to, to, to think about that. The, I guess we can start now by talking about the microbiome in, in Parkinson's disease. And um, it, obviously in your, in your gut, there are trillions of, of bacteria that, that help us metabolize some of our food and and produce a lot of compounds that we absorb that we, we couldn't have gotten otherwise. And people have been studying the, the gut microbiome for, for um, 10 years or so in, in chronic diseases like Parkinson's disease. And it's really a fascinating avenue of research because we've determined that there's very likely to be an abnormal uh, microbiome in, in people with Parkinson's disease, or at least it's different than people without Parkinson's disease. We're trying to figure out the reasons why. Um, some of the bacteria that are more prevalent in people without Parkinson's disease are thought of as being anti-inflammatory and kind of um, pro-gut health because they metabolize some of the fiber that comes through from plant foods and, and turn them into something called short chain fatty acids, which actually feed the lining of your gut. So um, what you eat affects what gut, what gut bacteria you have um, probably far more than what gut, what bacteria you take in in the form of a probiotic. Obviously probiotics are unregulated. So it's a little difficult to determine exactly what you're getting. Um, a lot of them are, uh, bifidobacteria and lactobacillus and, and, and organisms like that that may actually help in, in the upper GI system. Um, there's been one or two studies that suggest they might be helpful. Um, but uh, altering your um, gut bacteria, you're probably more likely to do, you're, you're sorry, your colon bacteria, you're probably more likely to do that by taking what's called prebiotics, which are basically the, the fibers that those bacteria eat. Um, the good and bad bacteria are are in all of us and um, it, which ones are thriving or which ones you feed. So if you want to feed the good bacteria, for the most part, they eat plant fiber. So eat more plant fiber, beans and greens and nuts and seeds and whole grains and things like that. Um, if you want to eat less 
uh, if you want to um, starve, we'll say, the, the bad bacteria, then try to eat less animal protein and animal um, products, uh, which can um, cause the proliferation of these, these bacteria that we think are more pro-inflammatory and more of a problem. Um, you mentioned uh, water and um, increasing that. Is there any sort of, you hear about eight glasses a day sort of recommendations that are out in public. Is that what you would say is um, recommended for patients with Parkinson's disease as well? Yeah, um, certainly uh, as we get older, the majority of Americans probably don't have enough fluid intake. Um, it, it's a very common problem and it, it can lead to a lot of different problems, including cognitive changes, but um, if you get mildly dehydrated. But I, I think um, there are different numbers out there. Uh, the, the best numbers I, I see are, if you're a woman, I think like six cups of water and a man, eight, eight to 10, something like that, or six to eight and eight to 10 is reasonable. But that includes um, what, uh, whatever liquids you take. So um, obviously, teas and, and, and uh, soda, although there's good reasons not to eat soda, but it's not just water. So your total fluid intake over the course of the day should be that much. And you should be getting a lot more uh, water in, in your diet as well, because obviously a lot of fruits and vegetables have lots of fluid in them as well. And one um, of our listeners has asked about alkaline water. And what your uh, thought is on alkaline water? So um, I, I don't recommend alkaline water. I'm not a huge believer in the whole um, science or, or body of evidence that, that supports that as a, as a treatment for, for anything, uh, frankly. Um, I don't have a ton of experience, so I'm not, I, I don't consider myself an authority on the subject, but... Um, I haven't been convinced by the evidence that I've seen that alkaline water is something that you need to be trying to supplement. Okay. Um, the other um, question is delayed gastric emptying, uh, it's a complication of Parkinson's. Um, can you first explain what delayed gastric emptying is to our Sure. When we say gastric, we mean the stomach. Um, and when you know remember what the stomach is there to do is ba it's basically to take the food that you you eat you, you chew up a bit um, and mix it with acid and some other things and, and basically turn it into a, a paste or a, a liquid that you can push through your intestines um, so the food sits there for a while in, in all of us um, unfortunately in some people with Parkinson's disease for someone in clear reasons it sits there too long and um, the, the the there's a sphincter at the end of this the stomach, uh, an opening that, that opens and closes and, and releases a, a, a bit of the fluid and matter from your stomach into your intestines. Um, and people with delayed gastric emptying um, with Parkinson's disease or other conditions experience uh, bloating and nausea and vomiting and uh, early satiety so that they, they eat less than they used to and they, and they feel full. Um, it's pretty clear that got, Delayed gastric emptying can also cause problems with levodopa um, administration because the, the levodopa gets absorbed into in the intestines. So if it's sitting longer in your in your stomach, it's not it's not going to get absorbed yet. So um, it has clear ramifications for for symptom management as well. Um, treating gastric uh, emptying delays is, is is not easy. And I think for the most part should be managed by a, a gastroenterologist. Um, changes in diet can help. There's, a, there's an organism called Helicobacter pylori, which can um, uh, overgrow the, the lining of the stomach in some people. Um, and so getting tested for that and treated for that, if that's, a, if that's something you have, is, is, worth, is worthwhile trying. Um, uh, exercise can help gastric emptying as well. Um, but like I said, for the most part, um, they're, they're, if you're in Canada, like you are, there's a medication called Domperidone, which is actually um, a dopamine antagonist that doesn't cross the blood-brain barrier, so that can be helpful. Unfortunately, it's not available, except you, some people order it from Canada by mail, I guess, but um, it's not available in the United States. Um, there are some other drugs in development that hopefully will come out 
um, in the not too distant future. There, we had a, a few, but they were withdrawn because of cardiac side effects. Uh, but so hopefully we'll have other options as well in the near future. Is this problem very common in Parkinson's patients? Gas, delayed gastric emptying. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, I, I don't have uh, off the top of my head, I don't, I don't know a specific prevalence number, but um, it, you know, probably a quarter to a third of people with Parkinson's disease will have problems with that. Um, a lot of them won't even re report it because they won't be thinking that it's related to the Parkinson's disease. But if, if you ask them if they're having those symptoms, um, yeah, and then you can get you can get them checked and, and try to treat them in the ways that I that I mentioned. Sometimes um, if someone has really erratic uh, levodopa response with with motor fluctuations early in the course of the illness, I'll I'll look for things like Helicobacter pylori to see if if that's potentially causing a problem with their levodopa absorption. Um, and, and frankly, I don't um, send them for the, the gastric emptying studies that often, but you know, some, sometimes we do as well. Um, so now let's look a little bit at how our nutrition can affect our Parkinson's. Um, particularly, we got a lot of questions about specific diets, keto, vegan, paleo, vegetarian, raw, um, for people with Parkinson's, and, and which, in your experience or, or in the medical literature, have you found work for Parkinson's? Sure. So th this is a question that I've been talking about for a while now, and if you Google my name, and either the Parkinson's Foundation or the World Congress, uh, the Parkinson's World Congress, there are um, lectures that I've given specifically about diet and, and Parkinson's disease that cover the topic in a lot more detail than we'll be able to today. Um, but it, it, in my mind, I don't think you know, it's pretty clear that, that no specific diet it has been, has a strong evidence base of support for, for, um, Parkinson's disease over over any other one because there just haven't been that many studies. Um, I, I there there was a study that came out last year from New Zealand that looked at a low fat diet compared to a ketogenic diet that proved that people with Parkinson's disease can do it. Um, so a ketogenic diet, to back up a little bit, is a is a diet that um, is very low in carbohydrates, so it requires your body to start um, burning glycogen stores and converting. Uh, fatty acids into, into ketone bodies, which are also a source of energy for your brain cells, which normally rely on glucose for their energy, but um, they, they can use ketone bodies instead. And there's um, the diet originated quite a while ago in the treatment of epilepsy in, in children, and there's, it has some benefits there. And people have proposed that, that these ketone bodies may have neuroprotective effects that could help other neurodegenerative diseases like Parkinson's disease or Alzheimer's disease. There are animal studies of these uh, um, diets or a ketogenic diet that it seemed to show some benefit, but there really isn't enough evidence to say that a, a given person with Parkinson's disease can, should adopt a ketogenic diet to slow down the degeneration of their, of their uh, brain cells. Um, I think, in, in my estimation, the, the, the best evidence out there suggests that a whole food plant-based diet or a Mediterranean-type diet has the best evidence at, at, for long-term health and wellness. I think that the evidence is pretty clear that adopting that type of diet will reduce your risk of dementia and uh, depression and constipation and a whole host of other things that that will help you in the long run, like reducing your risk of heart disease and cancer and, and strokes and diabetes and hypertension and things like that. So I feel comfortable recommending that people with Parkinson's disease and stop that kind of diet because number one, I don't think it's going to hurt anybody. Um, there are very few uh, reasons to believe that adopting that kind of diet would affect your Parkinson's disease adversely. And a diet that is full of fiber and full of phytonutrients or, or plant-based nutrients that um, include a, a whole host of antioxidants and anti-inflammatory molecules makes sense that it, it could help protect your brain against whatever is causing your your Parkinson's disease. Um, so that's what I recommend, and that's what I detailed in more in more at more length in some of these other presentations. 
Um, which other diets? Uh, um, could you actually, just for a moment, um, Dr. Judah, just explain just very briefly what you mean by Mediterranean diet? There may be some people that have heard the term. Sure. sure. So a Mediterranean diet is a term that's been around a long time, and it's, it's kind of gotten to mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people. But for, for the most part, I, I think of it as a diet that is um, focused on consumption of, of plant foods supplemented with small amounts of fish and perhaps some fermented forms of dairy, um, some alcohol, usually red wine. Um, and and uh, when the, if oil is used, then, then something like extra virgin olive oils. But um, for the mo you know, you think of the countries around the Mediterranean, like France and Spain and, and Tunisia and, and elsewhere, um, they have a similar diet based on their climate. And um, it's very low in, in meat consumption from from uh, pork and, and and cows and, and things like that. And, and protein consumption is more um, from beans and uh, grains and um, fish. Um, and there are all all kinds of different places where you can learn more about it online. And um, speaking of al alcohol, uh, someone wants to know, does alcohol make symptoms worse or are there symptoms that can be helped by alcohol? Does alcohol make symptoms worse? Um, I'm not aware of any symptoms. I mean, we're assuming we're talking, you know, moderate, healthy consumption of alcohol, low, low to moderate amounts. Um, I'm not aware of any symptoms that can be worsened. Uh, Interestingly, tremor um, from essential tremor it can be helped with alcohol. And I've seen some people who had either a combination of essential tremor and Parkinson's disease or just an action tremor, uh, you know, a tremor that came out much more when they were doing something than when at rest uh, benefit, or they, they would tell me that it would benefit from, from alcohol consumption. I don't prescribe alcohol consumption, but um, uh, that, that's a possibility. And you mentioned fish. So someone was wondering what it is about fish that's more beneficial for Parkinson's patients versus animal. But I think you were just saying in general that particular diet seems to be healthier for yeah, people in general. Yeah. I mean, so if people really want to, to, to know what I think, I think the best source um, online for nutritional information that, that is evidence-based and, and not biased is a website called nutritionfacts.org that is run by a, an internist, Dr. Michael Greger. Um, and it's very user friendly and, and lay person friendly. And he just reviews the literature showing you the evidence for why uh, what a, it's Mediterranean, but more often a whole food plant-based diet, which is a diet that is almost completely plants. And um, unlike a vegan diet, which includes a lot of unhealthy foods like um, Twinkies and, and uh, French fries and um, pretzels or something, a whole food plant-based diet is, is plant-based foods that are not very processed. So, so highly processed carbohydrates are, are eliminated from a whole food plant-based diet. And that kind of diet, I think, is, is probably the, got the most evidence for long-term health benefits. And that's what, what I recommend to my patients with Parkinson's disease, keeping in mind that um, most people are not going to adopt a completely whole food plant-based diet. Um, but it, I think um, changing the philosophy fr from, you know, your, your food is there to entertain you, to your food is there to nourish you and, and perhaps um, uh, improve your wellness it is, a good, is a good idea. And, it, you know, if you, if you need to eat a, a hamburger every once in a while to be happy, well, I, I don't want you to do it to be, you know, 100 years old and be miserable the rest of your life. So eat a hamburger when you have to. But for the most part, when you don't need to eat to, to make yourself feel better, be entertained, try to eat something that's, that's healthier for you. And, you know, starting out with like a meat this Monday or something like that is a good idea because once you start doing it, most people recognize that they feel better, that they have less constipation and, and less other symptoms. So they, they start trans transitioning more and more. And yeah, so there becomes an incentive to, to, to make it. Um, there's also a lot of questions about dairy, and what are your thoughts on dairy for people with Parkinson's? So um, there, there's now 
very well established evidence that the more dairy you consume, uh, there's a little bit of debate about which forms, but um, the more dairy you consume, the higher your your risk of getting Parkinson's disease over your life. Um, it's it's not as clear that um, if you give up dairy once you have Parkinson's disease, that you'll make a big difference in your in your disease progression. However, um, there are good reasons to believe that that might be the case, and for that reason, I, I do recommend that that people cut down or eliminate their their dairy intake. Um, the, there's a, a effects on uric acid level, which is you know one of the things that we're we're testing experimentally in Parkinson's disease. If increasing the the blood level of uric acid uh, can help Parkinson's disease as an antioxidant, and, and uh, eating drinking milk decreases your uric acid level. Um, so again, if you you know, cheese has a compound called casomorphine, which is the morphine analog. So that's why most people really like cheese and, um, or one of the reasons. And, uh, you know, if you have to eat cheese every once in a while to be happy, well, eat cheese every once in a while. But um, if, it, if you're okay with not eating cheese so much, or especially um, a whole, whole fat milk, uh, milk and, and things like that, then I recommend people uh, shy away from that. I don't think that there's anything in milk that you can't get from all food plant-based diet just as well or better. The cheese question ties into another question we got. Is cheese from a cow more harmful than cheese from a goat? Um, I, I, I don't think that there's a, a, a great reason to believe that a, a particular type of cheese is any better or worse for you. I mean, I think obviously there are some reasons to believe that that fully grass-fed uh, cheese, either from either species, may be better because it likely has higher levels of omega-3 fatty acids and things like that. Um, but uh, I'm not convinced that um, that one or the other form is clearly better for you. There is um, so much talk about the benefits of drinking drinking coffee, this person is writing, is they're asking, is it really beneficial for people with Parkinson's or is it only for those who don't yet have Parkinson's? I'm sorry, you're, for some reason you're breaking up a little bit and I couldn't quite... Oh, sorry. What they're, what they're asking is that there are so many benefits, uh, they say, for drinking coffee. Oh, and they coffee. are asking, okay, is right. it beneficial for people... Yeah, we, is it beneficial for people with Parkinson's disease already? Sure, for those sure. that have not had Parkinson's. So um, what is coffee? It's seed soup, right? It, it's, it's, coffee's a seed, it's not a bean, and you're making soup out of it. And, and I like seeds, and I like seed soups. So um, there are plenty of reasons to think that, that drinking coffee might be beneficial. There are a lot of antioxidants and anti-inflammatory compounds in, in, in coffee, just like there are in tea and a lot of other plant-based beverages that we can drink. Um, there were a couple studies uh, done in the last couple of years trying to see if if it did actually change symptoms or or uh, slow down the progression, and th th they were a little conflicting. But I think the latest evidence suggests that obviously tea, uh, coffee consumption can help with at least one symptom of Parkinson's disease, which is excessive daytime sleepiness. Um, you know, if, if you're having problems with being sleepy during the day because of your leave it open for whatever reason, obviously drinking coffee is one decent solution. Um, there's probably not, we don't have enough evidence to say that it's going to help you for, for most other reasons. Uh, we, we thought it might help a little bit with motor symptoms, but it, it, it didn't, it, that wasn't borne out by the evidence. So, um, it, it, you know, and, and that being said, you have to say uh, with everything regarding diet and nutrition deficit compared to what um you know coffee compared to whole fat milk yeah it's, it's almost certainly better for you coffee uh compared to or, or coffee that's loaded up with, with sugar and cream is probably not as good for you as some other things um so uh it depends on on what you're comparing it to that's fair enough um one of our listeners actually um is describing a situation that's probably fairly common with people. They, she says that we're in a, a, an assisted living center where most food is packaged, very few fresh veggies, lots of carbs and sweets, 
food as part of their package, but it's harming my husband's park. Uh, it's, it's harming, she feels, her husband with Parkinson's disease and that he's not getting good nutrition. So what do you recommend to someone that's working with another institution? Like how, how should they go about affecting change? That's a, that's a great question and something that, that comes up for me a lot. I work at the Philadelphia VA Medical Center, so I deal with a lot of veterans who are in nursing homes and, right. and uh, whether for veterans or not. And, and you don't have a lot of uh, opportunity to, to change your, your diet or nutrition when you're in a facility like that. I think um, it, uh, can I say definitively that, that whatever that diet is, which is almost certainly uh, similar to the standard American diet, is hurting her husband. I, I think that would, that would be a bit of a stretch. But um, I would encourage her to maybe to, to talk to the facility and, and to see if she could work with them. I mean, there are plenty of low-cost um, plant-based foods that, that, that would be healthy alternatives to, to the standard fare that you get in a facility like that. So ideally, she could at least make some headway and, and have some, some more options available for her husband. Fair enough. Um, the next question is discussing more about how to use nutrition to help with some of the non-motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease. Um, this writer writes that I have terrible insomnia as well, sleepiness and fatigue. Are there any nutritional choices, I guess other than the coffee you mentioned, uh, that I can make that might help me fall asleep and stay asleep longer? So um, that's a good question. Um, there are uh, some plant-based sources of melatonin. Melatonin is a hormone in the brain that is involved in sleep regulation, and, and some people with Parkinson's disease benefit from taking supplemental melatonin, but there are plant-based sources of melatonin and dark cherries and goji berries and almonds and things like that. The levels, for the most part, are, are fairly low, so um, it'd be, it might be hard to get an adequate uh, boost in your melatonin levels from from any of those things, but there are some studies that suggest they might be helpful. Um, obviously, uh, nocturnal urination is a, is a problem for a lot of people sleeping, so avoiding m much fluid intake after dinner time can, can be helpful. Um, I, those are the only things I can think of. Off the top of my head. Um, there's also questions about other supplements like vitamin D, for instance, vitamin E, homocysteine, CoQ10. Can we address some of those, perhaps, for example, vitamin D. What's the recommendation for patients um, with Parkinson's disease and vitamin D? Good question. So, so vitamin D is often deficient in, in elderly people, whether or not they have Parkinson's disease, and it's probably even more commonly, sorry, not elevated, and decreased in, in people with Parkinson's disease. Vitamin D, as most people remember, is the, the sunshine vitamin. So um, you, you make your own vitamin D when you get exposed to sunlight. Most of us, particularly living in latitudes like yours or mine, uh, would have to run around naked at noon for about an hour to get enough uh, sun, sunlight to make our own vitamin D. And in the winter, you, you get virtually none because the sun is, isn't up high enough and, and the rays that you need get blocked by the, by the atmosphere. So um, the uh, the vast majority of people with Parkinson's disease that I've tested have low levels and, and most of them I supplement and I supplement them fairly vigorously because in addition to bone metabolism, it's fairly clear that, that, that uh, vitamin D is also involved in uh, other things like uh, mood and, and, and memory and, and things like that. So um, I encourage everybody with Parkinson's disease to get tested for uh, vitamin D efficiency and, and supplement it if necessary. What about calcium, I guess, because we've been thinking about um, bone uh, susceptibility to fractures and that sort of thing. What's your recommendation when it comes to calcium? So um, th I think that a bit of the, the urge to supplement calcium in elderly people um, has, been, has been overblown. They're, they're Obviously, osteoporosis is a common problem, but vitamin D may be just as big a part of that problem as, as calcium loss. Um, there are great um, plant-based sources of, of calcium, 
including leafy greens and beans and things like that. And um, uh, for the most part, I think given what we now know about calcium supplementation and heart disease risk, uh, most people do not recommend taking supplemental calcium. Um, so I guess, I mean, you recommend people getting the vitamin D level checked. Are there any other supplements that you would recommend patients with Parkinson's go on um, in terms of trying to help manage their disease or, or is, is the jury out on, on most of them? Yeah. Um, so there are a lot of different things that, that people have uh, talked about, like coenzyme Q10 and um, N-acetylcysteine. And I do recommend that most people with Parkinson's disease get their, their vitamin B12 and homocysteine levels checked because that's a, another fairly common deficiency in people with Parkinson's disease and supplement those. Um, there's a debate about whether uh, omega-3 fatty acids might be helpful, and I think the the, the debate's not really not resolved and um I, I do think it's reasonable for people to take a, a a supplementation of those agents um but uh other than those i think we're really lacking the the, the high quality evidence that we would need to to recommend supplementation with other molecules or other supplements great thank you um the i i think we should move on and maybe talk about um our Parkinson's medications and uh, what um, what can interfere with those medications in terms of our diet. I, people have asked a lot about protein, for instance. They've been told to avoid protein um, when taking their their medications. Um, how would you um, how do you approach that with your patients in terms of, of timing of medications and why why is it an issue? I guess in the first place. Yeah. So. Good question. Um, Cinemet is a combination of two compounds, levodopa, which is the precursor to dopamine and carbidopa, which helps it uh, prevent it from getting metabolized before it gets to the brain. Um, and levodopa is very similar in structure to an amino acid. And in fact, it's, it's absorbed into the gut, into the brain by the same transmitter that absorbs some of the amino acids that are found in proteins. Proteins are, are made up of long strings of amino acids. And um, so if you take uh, cinema, while you have a lot of amino acids from protein in your, in your intestines, it's competing for absorption through the same mechanism and, it, and the absorption can be decreased. So um, it, some people will, rec will recognize a, a clear difference if they take levodopa after having a meal that has a lot of protein in it. Some people don't notice as much of a difference. Um, particularly early on in the course of the illness. But if you are, have someone who's having motor fluctuations where sometimes your cinemat works really well and sometimes it doesn't or it wears off, then I think looking at the relationship between when you're taking your protein and when you're, um, when you're uh, sorry, I have a puppy who's making a racket. But um, when, when you're eating your protein and when you're taking the levodopa can, can make a difference. And um, there's something called the protein redistribution diet where people take the vast majority of their protein at their evening meal when uh, it's less problematic if they have less of an effect from their cinnamon, um, which has been shown to work for a lot of people. So I, I think it's reasonable. Um, in general, um, you know, it, it, the diet that I recommend has a lower level of protein. We're, we're kind of, uh, you know, protein is all, all the rage now. Everybody wants to take more and more protein, but the evidence supports that, that um, the vast majority of us are actually getting too much protein and it's, it's probably causing damage to our kidneys and other things. So um, not worrying so much about how much protein you're, you're, you're eating and, and taking more of it. Either um, you can take your cinnamon half an hour before you, you, you eat a meal with protein in it or an hour afterwards or redistributing it so that most of your protein intake is at your evening meal uh, can be very helpful. Great. Someone else wants to know, are there other common Parkinson's medications that um, may impact when and what I should eat? Um, so, sorry, you, you broke up a little bit. Are there sorry, other they're, they're asking about, if, are there other common uh, Parkinson's medications that impact when and what I should eat? Um, other medications that impact what and when you should eat? Uh, so, you know, there are a lot of different options for people who have problems with levodopa absorption for, for whatever reason. Uh, there's an orally dissolving 
levodopa called paracopa, which actually doesn't get absorbed in the mouth. It gets, still gets absor absorbed in the stomach, so it, it may not make that much of a difference. But there's, there's now a compound called embresia, which is an orally absorbed spray that, that you can use to help absorb your levodopa. Um, there's a duopa, which is an intestinal gel of, of levodopa that um, is, uh, is, is an option as well. Um, so uh, there, are, there are, I can't think of any other medications that would cause problems with their nutrition other than the dopamine agonist and, and uh, uh, cravings and impulse control disorders that we discussed previously. Right. Now, some of our PD medications give us side effects, such as nausea, vomiting, pain, heartburn, um, dry mouth, and so forth. Are there um, any um, nutritional uh, choices that you can make that would help with some of that? Yeah, so, um, you know, pick one and we can do it. But so, so um, obviously, uh, nausea, there are if it's due to gastric emptying problems, we've already discussed solutions for that. Um, in, in insomnia, we've already discussed solutions for that. Um, lightheadedness or orthostatic hypertension, there are clear uh, dietary uh, or, uh, lifestyle choices you can make for that, specifically increasing your fluid intake, increasing your, in your intake of salt if you don't have a problem with supine hypertension or when you lie down, your blood pressure goes, goes too high and sorry. Orthostatic hypertension is when you stand up, your blood pressure goes too low, so you feel lightheaded or dizzy. Um, uh, uh, did you mention some others? Um, dry mouth. Dry mouth. Um, there are s some companies that sell products that are not nutritional, but but I think they, they are helpful. And if you just Google dry mouth treatments, um, you'll find a number of them. Uh, basically, they help. Um, lubricate the mouth with things other than saliva. Um, um, and there's a few more questions since we're coming towards the end of our webinar. Um, someone wants to know, is there a relationship between celiac disease and Parkinson's? Celiac disease and Parkinson's disease. I, um, I'm not aware of anybody who's proposing a, a, a strong relationship between celiac disease and Parkinson's disease. Obviously, um, some of the symptoms can overlap a little bit, but um, uh, it, it is not, you know, it, it doesn't really come up on the differential for, for Parkinsonism or uh, it's not something that we look for in people with Parkinson's disease. Okay. And, and whole, let me, let me um, just elaborate a little bit on that. Um, there are people who believe that the vast majority of us should be avoiding um, grains, uh, you know, wheat and other grains that have gluten or other uh, proteins. And I, I think that the literature supporting that is, is not very robust. I think um, whole grain products that include the, the bran and the germ have a, had a lot of nutritional benefits for people with Parkinson's disease and everyone else. Um, you know, one to 2% of the population has true celiac disease. And it's not clear how many other people have uh, gluten intolerance or a, a less severe form of reaction to gluten, but um, it, they, they've done studies and most people who think they're gluten intolerant actually aren't. Um, so it's, it's not as prevalent as we think. And, you know, the whole gluten-free uh, rage, you know, goes on. But um, I, I'm a believer that, you know, it, it's, when, you, when you go on a gluten-free diet, you're eliminating processed carbohydrates right so really? white bread and white pizza and white rice and, and everything so that's a good idea whether or not you're worried about gluten but if you're if you're eliminating all grains because of a fear of gluten intolerance then you're eliminating whole grains um you know whole, whole grain breads and whole grain the, the, the grains themselves um that have a lot of health benefits from uh wonderful sources of fiber and protein and other things. So I, I do think that people um, should think twice before eliminating all uh, gluten-containing products from their diet. 
Just this goes back to what we were talking about earlier about um, uh, the gut microbiome. Um, someone's asking what tests are recommended to determine gut health, such as spectrocell, CBC, metal tests, et cetera, to determine deficiencies and growth of bad bacteria. Do you recommend that people get certain tests done to look at their gut microbiome? So um, I, I think it's a little premature to, to recommend a particular test for gut microbiome analysis. We're really in the, in the stage of, of research for, for microbiome analysis. I think that the, the studies that are out there are, are group-based studies. And, and frankly, you know, we, you know, we do know that it, if you have a uh, microbiome that is, is prevalent with a lot of forms of bacteria that are kind of pro-inflammatory or, or the, the ones that we think that may be somewhat detrimental, if you change your diet to, to a predominantly whole food plant-based diet, within two weeks, you can dramatically change the, the gut flora that you have. So, um, we, you know, rather than... The, an individual microbiome analysis isn't that helpful to, to a given phys clinician, I think. But um, as, a, as a whole, people with Parkinson's disease could probably benefit by, by modifying what they're eating to, to feed the, the healthy bacteria. There are a lot of other tests, to things for look, to, to look for things like um, small bowel overgrowth, uh, small intestinal over, bowel overgrowth, which is another form of bacteria that are normally in, in the colon growing up into the small intestine and um, perhaps blocking the absorption of certain things like levodopa. If I have someone who has um, either requires really high dosages of, of cinnamon to get a benefit or has profound motor fluctuations with, with some doses that work and some don't and, and um, on and off fluctuations throughout the day, I, I have been starting to send people for evaluation for small bowel intestinal overgrowth, which um, it, it's not that hard. There's some breath tests and, and uh, stool tests that, that can now look for, the stool test is for H. pylori, but um, we can also look for SIBO and, and some, sometimes treating that uh, has been shown to be helpful in certain studies. Thank you so much. Um, as we come to, to the end of our webinar, Dr. Duda, it's, um, is there anything that you wanted to convey that we perhaps haven't covered yet? I know it was a lot that we tried to cover in this. Hour. Yeah, I mean, I, I think um, the, the one thing I would say is that, so I, in, in Philadelphia, um, at the clinic that I direct, we got tired of looking or waiting for the, the big breakthrough that was gonna slow down the progression of Parkinson's disease. And we're still hopeful that it's right around the corner. But in the meantime, um, we found that, that people who fight back against the disease by changing their lifestyle and, and doing the things that we think can help preserve your brain health and perhaps slow down the, the, the progression of the disease it empowers them in such a way that, that it, it clearly changes the way that they experience the disease. Um, you're, you're not someone who's a victim who's just w waiting for the disease to progress. You're, you are someone who's fighting back against the disease, waiting and staying as healthy as possible until we get, do get those treatments that are going to slow down or stop the progression of the disease. So I applaud everybody who's doing that. I encourage everybody who's not to, to try to do that. There are innumerable good sources like, like your webinar and others that um, provide uh, solid recommendations for people on how to, to fight back. I mean, we've, you know, in one hour, we can really just scratch the surface, but obviously um, exercise is something you guys are, are are big at promoting and the evidence for maintaining a healthy exercise routine um, are just as, uh, or even more robust than maintaining a healthy diet. So all the things that go into a, a healthy lifestyle, including exercise, nutrition, sleep management, stress management, social connection, all those things, I encourage people to, to work on actively and, and, uh, and just keep fighting. Great work to end on. I would like to thank you sincerely, Dr. Duda, for sharing your time and expertise with us today. I know I found it personally very useful and practical and educational. And as, we sign off, <laughs> as I sign off, I'd like to leave you all with this. As Dr. Duda said, you must be an active participant in order to live well with this disease. And this includes being mindful of certain important aspects of your life, including your nutritional status. Nutrition can impact, as we've learned, your disease, and likewise, Parkinson's can affect your nutrition. 
so work with your medical team and your support circle to address any of the issues we discussed today. Stay motivated, continue to educate yourself, and celebrate your daily victories. Until next time, be well. Thank you.